all right what is going on scholars welcome back to class if this is your first time tuning in welcome to play black wall street academy if you are enrolled in the course we appreciate you if you are watching on youtube make sure you give us a like and a subscription now if you've been following us you you probably know a little bit about tulsa's black wall street right you know about greenwood little africa aka tulsa's black wall street but sometimes we we don't really dive deep into the people who helped build Tulsa's black wall street All right and today is martin luther king day so i want to open up with two questions for you question number one is what is your dream All right what is it what is your dream? And we're about to learn about nine entrepreneurs who, who had a mission. Nine entrepreneurs who had a dream and their dream led them to become a part of history, right? A hundred years later, we're still talking about these entrepreneurs. We're still talking about the legacy and the lessons of Tulsa Black Wall Street a hundred years later so my number one question for you right as you're going through as you're learning some of the stories of these entrepreneurs i want you to think about what is your dream and how can you use your dream to help other people it is literally impossible you can't do it you cannot talk about the history of tulsa black wall street without mentioning the visionary the real estate mogul, the businessman himself, O.W. Gurley. Born on Christmas Day, December 25th, 1868 in Huntsville, Alabama, Ottawa, or O.W. Gurley would later be known as the founder and builder of the Greenwood District. Now, he was raised in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. Anybody from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, or anybody from Alabama where he was born, feel free to drop some love inside of the comments. Or if you're enrolled in this course, go ahead and shout out where you're from inside of the discussion tab. All right. Now, he was born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas to freed slaves, and he would grow up self educated and he would then grow up to marry his childhood sweetheart. Shout out to love, Miss Emma. After becoming a teacher and teaching for a while, he later on joined the United States Post Office. Now, at age 21, okay, I really want y'all to like really think about this. At age 21, O.W. Gurley and his wife participated in the 1889 Oklahoma land rush. They first settled in Perry, Oklahoma. They started a business. He worked as an educator, but later on, they found out what was happening in Tulsa, right? They heard some, some things that were rustling and bustling in Tulsa, and they decided to pick up from Perry, Oklahoma, and travel down to Tulsa. This is where he, of course, bought his additional 40 acres in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1906, and he imposed a very restrictive covenant, right? A restrictive uh, kind of policy that said the land can only be sold to black businesses or black families. This settlement, of course, later on became known as Little Africa, AKA Tulsa's Black Wall Street, AKA Greenwood. Now, during the Tulsa massacre of 1921, O.W. Gurley was jailed for inciting violence, but he enlisted the support of two black leaders in the community, which we will definitely be covering later on. But those two black leaders were J.B. Stratford and A.J. Smitherman. Now, once he got out of jail, he fled Tulsa. Him and his wife went to California, where they started a motel. And later on, O.W. Gurley died at age 67, just 14 years later. Now, something that I take away, right, from the experience and from the just journey of O.W. Gurley. And if you have a, a word, if you have a, le a lesson, feel free to drop it inside of the comments or drop it inside the discussion if you're enrolled in the course. But something that I for sure get is vision, right? O.W. Gurley had his vision and not only did he have his vision but he was willing to commit to that vision right they had the 
the kind of the the comfortable lifestyle in, in Pine Bluff, but he was like, no, I don't want that. Let's go get the land grab and let's go to Perry, Oklahoma. And then he was hearing some more things in Perry, Oklahoma about Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was like, no, let's pack up. Let's go to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, and not only did he have the vision of 40 acres and only selling to, to black families and creating the, the street names and this is the business district, this is the residential district and just mapping all that out, but he actually did it, right? We're now able to learn about Tulsa's Black Wall Street, his vision that he had and he actually created. So I would highly, highly recommend, right? And it's, it's, it's difficult to do sometimes, but as we approach Black History Month, right? As we are in Dr. Martin Luther King Day today and we're reflecting on the legacy of Dr. King, what is your dream? What is your vision for your own future or for the future of your community? And how can you start taking small steps, small actions toward that vision? Now, another legend responsible for the construction, the foundation, the building of Tulsa's Black Wall Street is John the Baptist Stratford or J.B. Stratford. J.B. Stratford was born in Versailles, Kentucky in 1861, and his father, J.C. Stratford, was a recently emancipated slave living in Stratford, Ontario. Now, he's very well known for real estate investing, and J.B. Stratford is also well known for civil rights advocacy. But before his education, there's not too much that's known about him. So he did graduate from Overland College in 1896 and went off to Indiana Law School in 1899. But again, before that, not too much is known about him other than he was a definitely wise and conscientious investor who owned and operated boarding homes and pool rooms all over Kentucky and St. Louis, Missouri. Stratford and his wife Augusta moved to Indian Territory, now known as Oklahoma, in 1899, settling in a newfound town known as Tulsa, where he became just a prominent citizen, figure, and businessman. He and O.W. Gurley were able to establish a fortune in real estate by having apartment buildings that were able to really support the working class black community within Greenwood. Stratford also became a local African-American civil rights leader who opposed lynching and many of the new Jim Crow laws that were passed once Oklahoma became a state in 1907. Now, again, something important to know that before 1907, Oklahoma was Indian territory, right? So the normal Jim Crow laws or discrimination laws that were seen throughout the South weren't experienced in Oklahoma prior to 1907. It was a kind of an open free state where, where blacks, whites, indigenous populations, Native Americans were all able to kind of commingle, do business, and even have relationships together. But once Oklahoma became a state, now all of the, the normal Jim Crow laws and legislation were trying to be passed within Oklahoma. So J.B. Stratford was one of the civil rights advocates that were really trying to fight against those discriminatory policies. On June 1st, 1918, J.B. Stratford opened up the Stratford Hotel on 301 North Greenwood. This was a hotel that had 54 rooms. Right, we're talking about real estate. We are talking about generational wealth. But unfortunately, on June 1st, 1921, Stratford had to stand in front of his hotel armed with a rifle to protect the white mob that was trying to destroy his hotel. Unfortunately, he and a lot of other businessmen were not successful or not able to defend their property and defend their legacy. And his hotel, the Stratford Hotel, was burnt down. Now, J.B. Stratford and 20 other black people were charged with rioting. Even though they were protecting their own business, they were charged with rioting. And Stratford's attorney was his own son, C.F. Stratford. Speaking of generational wealth, right? Speaking of just building a strong family, his own son was a lawyer and was able to bail him out. Now, some things that I that I take away from J.B. Stratford, right? And again, of course, definitely let me know what, what's one word, what's one lesson that you're taking away from Stratford. But what I'm what I'm getting, right? What I'm picking up from what J.B. was putting down is 
Wait for it. It's two, two words. Sounds like hesitate. <laughs> Sounds like hesitate. Real estate, right? He had the Stratford Hotel with 54 rooms. Can you imagine owning a building with 54 rooms and really being able to one supply quality housing to a community while at the same time you're getting that passive income of 54 doors and this was in 1918 all right he built a hotel owned a hotel with 54 doors in 1918 so for you if you're into if you're into real estate right for you if you're into passive income think about how you can start utilizing real estate to generate generational wealth for you and for generations to come. All right, scholars, I hope y'all are enjoying learning more about the people, about the individual dreams behind the legacy of Tulsa Black Wall Street. Up next, we definitely have another huge figure and another dreamer. Born in December 27th, 1883 in Childsburg, Alabama, we have A.J. Smitherman, who was known for being a political activist he was known for really supporting the black community when it came to law, and he was a press publication pioneer for sure. Smitherman and his family moved to the Indian Territory with his parents in the 1890s. He attended the University of Kansas and Northwestern University in Everston, Illinois, but he would later off receive his law degree from LaSalle University in Philadelphia. He, of course, married his sweetheart, Oli B. Murphy, in 1910, and the couple had five beautiful children. I, I just love hearing about some of these notable, I guess, people in black history that had families, right, that were married and had families. I think oftentimes, unfortunately, in, in today, right, 2022, it, we're, we're kind of told that we need to choose between being ambitious, between being great, between making history and having a, a beautiful family. So I think it's cool just the fact that we're learning about a few different people throughout our history that we're still learning about a hundred years later and we're able to establish a family. Just a little, little, little random sprinkle in there. Shout out to black love, right? <laughs> but. A.J. Smitherman was a political activist and press pioneer. He founded the Tulsa Star in 1913, which was America's first black democratic nationwide newspaper. All right, 1913, the America's first black democratic nationwide newspaper. That's huge. And Tulsa Star is one of the businesses that you can buy in Black Wall Street, the board game. So is the Stratford Hotel, sure is the Gurley Hotel, right? As few of these businesses that we're learning about from these people, you actually get to interact with and play with in Black Wall Street, the board game, just in case you didn't know, all right? Go ahead and check that out, playblackwallstreet.com, in case you don't already have it. We appreciate it. Now, while African Americans or blacks all across the country have been making pretty good economic strides, Smitherman, Smitherman, I said Smitherin. What was I confusing that with? Slytherin, that's what I was confusing it with. It is not Slytherin, just it is Smitherman, not Slytherin, okay? Let's, let's, not, let's not confuse those two, that's a, that's a big difference there. Now, although African Americans and blacks across the country were, were making some pretty good strides, Smithman really urged them to exercise their constitutional rights, which includes voting, self-defense against mobs, and lynchings. Unfortunately, during the Tulsa Race Massacre in 1921, him and his family would be forced to evacuate Tulsa just for their safety because he was one of those prominent leaders within the community. The family, including the five children, landed in Buffalo, New York, and in Buffalo, New York, A.J. Smitherman would then go off to build and create the Buffalo Star in that community as well. He would continue to fight and advocate for his people until the day that he died. Now, of course, some things that I, I, I pick up from the legacy of Smitherman, right? And I'm really trying to just highlight one thing. There's so many lessons and nuggets, right, that we can pick up from these entrepreneurs and these great people throughout history. But for the sake of time, it's going to do one. 
but it's up to you to put your nuggets in the comments. It's up to you to put your nuggets in the discussion if you're rolling the course, just so we can get some more perspectives, right? But for me, what I see is one word, star, right? No matter where you go, no matter what city you end up in, no matter what your circumstances, you got to be you. You got to shine and you got to do what you're passionate in. I love that in 1911, when he first got to Oklahoma, he created the Muskogee Star, right? When he then got into to Tulsa in 1913, he created the Tulsa Star. When he was forced to leave Tulsa and he had to relocate to, to Buffalo, he created the Buffalo star and yes i'm kind of doing a a little play on words but he found how he can shine and how he can really help solve problems and how he can dive into his passion no matter where he was forced or chose to go and i know sometimes it can get well it can get a little bit disheartening like maybe you're you're going to a new middle school, maybe you're going to a new high school, you're going off to college for the first time, you're moving from city to city, job to job, and sometimes you can think like, okay, let me let me just not do what I used to do, right? Let me hide pieces of, of myself, but you need to be the same star no matter where you are, right? And hey, that rhyme, be the same star no matter where you are, but let I me mean, keep keep on track here shine right find your lane find what you're passionate in and to the best of your ability no matter where you are be that star and shine as bright as you possibly can no matter where you are all right up next we have you know someone that m most y'all may not like right if you're <laughs> if you're not too fond of school if you're not too fond of education th this man loved school right he he literally built schools and he was a principal and his like education was really his life if you don't know who we're talking about yet we are talking about ellis walker woods born in june 29th 1885 in winston county mississippi ellis walker woods is most known for being a educational leader within the oklahoma community now there's not too much known about his parents, although the 1930 census would say that they lived in North Carolina. But besides that, not too much is known about Ellis Walker Woods' family or really his, his upbringing and his parents. But what we do know is that he went to the Auxiliary Manual Trainings Normal School in Pittsburgh, Kansas, which is now known as Pittsburgh State University. Woods also thought that you know he would become a teacher and get a teaching job in Memphis, Tennessee, but but he didn't make it, right? And that that's one of the lessons that we can take from from his journey is just because it doesn't work the first time, just because it doesn't work exactly the way that you wanted it to work, doesn't mean it won't work out eventually. It doesn't mean that you still can't make history, right? So keep keep going. Don't let the the small barriers or the maybe the small L's you take along the road stop you from achieving your greatness. So. Ellis Walker Woods did not stop. His luck changed when he came upon a poster stating that Oklahoma needed black instructors. Woods, when he was 27 years old, right? He's 27 and now he's, he's getting into his, his journey, right? 27, finally getting into his bag, right? He walked over 412 miles to teach in Oklahoma in 1911. He was offered one job in, in Bristow in 1912, and just as he began to, to teach in Sapalpa, Oklahoma, he was also hired as a principal at Tulsa's Dunbar High School. Now, Woods would turn down the position at Tulsa Dunbar School for the position at Bristow, but he would later have to come back to Tulsa for a position and opportunity he couldn't refuse. You know that movie reference? Go ahead, go ahead and put in the comments what that movie reference is and how beautiful my impersonation was. But Ellis Walker Woods would come back and later become the founding principal of the Booker T. Washington High School, which to this day is still in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So apart from being just a outstanding, phenomenal, literally historical principal, Ellis Walker Woods was also a strong pillar within the community. 
right? So he was the president of the Oklahoma Association for Negro Teachers. He was a part of the Greenwood Chamber of Commerce, a chairman in the Hutcherson branch of the YMCA. YMCA, I'm not doing it to the YMCA. Back to it. Um, and a trustee of the Vernon AME Church branch of the NAACP. So in addition to, again, just being an educational leader, he was also just a, a community leader, right? He was someone who was present inside of the community. I think that is what makes him stand out as an educator was the fact that you didn't only see him in the class. You didn't only see him walking around, you know, asking people for their homework or asking people why they're late for school, but he was also in the community fighting for your rights. Right? He was also inside of the community helping other teachers be better teachers. He was also in the Greenwood Chamber of Commerce making sure that the community was able to be economically healthy and sound. So I love the fact that he was just doing other things in the community. And I feel like that's what made the students trust him more. I think that's what made the students really say that, okay, well, if, if Ellis Walker Woods, if Principal Woods is saying I should do this and I see him doing all these things in the community, let, let, let me go ahead and, and tap in with Principal Woods. Let me go ahead and, and make sure I show him the respect that he deserves because he's doing so much work. Now, I've already, I've already kind of talked about the, the lesson that I take, right? And definitely feel free as usual, put the lesson that you take from Ellis Walker Woods or the, the character traits that you take from him inside of the comments or inside of the discussion if you're enrolled in the course. But something that I take away, ah, there's a lot, right? I, I, as a self-proclaimed educator, I, I really vibe with the legacy of Ellis Walker Woods, right? But something that I'm going to really, I think, take away is My handwriting is terrible, but it's integration, right? And not integration in the sense of like racial integration, but integration in the sense that how can you as a leader integrate yourself into different aspects of the community, right? Especially when it comes to, I think, dealing with, with youth, they need to see you in different lights, right? So if you're a, an educator today, how can your, your students see you in the classroom as an educator? How can they see you in possibly social media, right, as a person who still maybe is educating, who is still serving as a social or civil role model out there for your students? How can your students see you doing what you love, right? So for me, it might be, you might see me playing basketball, you might see me making courses on YouTube, you might see me writing a book. So how can they really see you in your element um, community service right are you doing things during thanksgiving and christmas that your students can see just literally like how are you integrating into the community and serving at different levels i feel like that's as a leader crucial right if you want to be a leader in the community i feel like it's crucial to to make sure that you are visible and serving in different capacities and in different ways but I'm interested to know, right? Let, let me know what is a, a lesson that you're taking away from the legacy of Principal Woods. All right, scholars, thanks for rocking with me. Thanks for staying locked in and focused. Up next, I got a, I got a fun one, right? I think it's fun, but then again, I'm a, I'm a black history nerd, so I think all of these have been fun, but <laughs> I think this one may be particularly fun for you. We are talking about someone born in Granada, Mississippi in 1890 and known for building a transportation empire. Do you know who we're talking about yet? Feel free, leave your, leave your guesses in the discussion. If you're enrolling the course, if you're watching live, leave your guesses on the comments or in the chat. But we are talking today about Simon Barry, right? So Simon Barry taught, before he got to Tulsa, he taught auto mechanics at West Tennessee College, and he arrived in Tulsa, according to some, some new papers and data we were able to find as early as 1915. He started a, a jitney service that catered specifically to Greenwood's black community. Now, for those that you know don't know jitney, maybe you only know Uber, you only know Lyft, jitneys were like the, 
the taxi service of, of the time, right? And it was kind of a, not an a, a official cab, not an official taxi, it was, a, it was a jitney. But because the black community couldn't use the white taxi services, Simon Barry really, really was able to fill that gap, right? He saw that problem, he saw that need in the community, so he was able to organize this jitney service. He also owned a hotel, started a bus service, and because of his aviation skills, he founded his own airline charter. Now, some people think that after the, the Tulsa Race Massacre in 1921, that you know entrepreneurship and just people in general in the Greenwood community did not rebuild, and that is not true. A lot of entrepreneurs did stick around. They were able to fight through and really show their resilience and almost rebuild the entire community of Tulsa Black Wall Street. Unfortunately, due to urban re renewal in the 1940s, Black Wall Street wasn't able to rebuild fully to what it was in 1921. But after the 1921 race massacre, Barry was a part of the entrepreneurs who really tried to rebuild and bring back the business district of Greenwood. He built a park that was 13 acres in the district and included a swimming pool, a dance hall, and picnic grounds. And of course, he also added in there the Tulsa Historical Society and a museum. Simon Barry also built a private transportation network full of Model T's and buses. The bus system, again, would later on be purchased by the city of Tulsa. So you have to think about building a, a business that you can then sell to a city or sell to a corporation, right? Sam Bear was doing this in the early 1900s. In addition to all of his businesses, Simon Barry also began chartering planes for Tulsa's most wealthy oil barons within the community. Now, a lot, of, a lot of really cool lessons you can learn from the legacy of Simon Barry, right? But something that I see, uh, I see, I see, I see two, but I think I'm gonna go with, with one for sure, right? I'm gonna go with one, and that is scale, right? I think a lot of, uh, you know, small businesses, we start off and we're able to do it ourselves, right? We're able to teach a course ourselves. We're able to do taxes one-on-one. -on -one. We're able to do a hair company one-on-one, -on -one, but we're not able to scale out that business, have the organization, have the system, have the, the routes and the leadership to be able to build a entire organization or system. So the fact that Simon Barry, right, he not only was able to create, you know, one service, right? So he had the Jitney service, which was like a, a cab service, but then he also had the bus service. Then he also had the airline service. So on top of scalability, another thing that I really see is finding your niche and diving into that niche, right? Finding that market, finding that industry, finding that thing that you are really good at and just taking it as far as you can. For Simon Barry, his niche, his market, hands down was what? What, what, what do you think? Go ahead, go ahead and put your, put your guess in the, in the discussion. But I'm, I'm, I'm gonna write it down. What was Simon Barry's market or niche? All right, so again, if you can read my handwriting, it is transportation, okay? That is his niche. Whether it's a cab service, whether it's public transportation through buses, whether it's transportation in the air through planes, he is focused on the niche of transportation. So something that you can think about right, as you're going through and you're learning about the different legacies of people is what market do you want to be like just the, the king or the queen or the, the royalty of, right? Is it the transportation market, the education market, health, wealth and financial literacy? Is it fashion and beauty, technology? What market do you really want to, to focus on and become an expert in for the next 10, 20, 30 years? Think about it. All right, up next, we got not just one entrepreneur, not just one legend, but we got entrepreneurs that came together to build a beautiful family and to build an economic empire. We are talking about John and Lala Williams. 
Now, Lala T. Williams was born in 1879 in Jackson, Madison County, Tennessee. She worked as a teacher in Memphis, Tennessee, where she met her future husband. In enters John Wesley Williams, who was born in 1883 and worked at the Illinois Central Railroad. Now, the Williams would grow up to really become symbols of black love and black wealth within Greenwood. They would be able to own and found the first and only black theater within Tulsa, Williams Land Theater. They would own a rooming house, a candy store, and a car garage. Now, some may think, because of some, some stereotypes or really cultural norms of the time, that John was responsible for building all of the businesses and Laula was possibly at home with the kids. Completely incorrect. Laula Williams was an active participant in building their empire and really served as an example for women within the community and a mentor for young girls growing up, including Mabel B. Little who was from Bowley, Oklahoma, and arrived in Tulsa with just $1.25 in 1913. Mabel would grow up to be 104 years old, being one of the survivors of the Tulsa Race Massacre, and would go up to found a thriving hair salon that would go off for decades. Now, the really cool thing that I see about John and Lala Williams is they each kind of had their own gifts, right? They each kind of had their own passions and they were able to build businesses separately and together with those passions. John was a auto mechanic genius, right? He can work on cars and anything with, with the motor. So he created his own car garage that was able to be patronized by both white car owners and black car owners. So you can imagine the amount of money that he was able to make being of service to both communities. Laula, on the other hand, was really passionate about starting their candy store. So she started Williams Confectionery to really dive into that passion. So they each independently had their own businesses, but they also had the rooming house and the movie theater, which they started together. Now, this one might be obvious, right? It, 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 it might be, but I wanna know from, from your side, what's something that you're taking away from the legacy of John and Laula Williams, right? One word, characteristic, or lesson, go ahead and put it inside of the comments. But you know what I'm putting down. You know the lesson that I'm taking away is for sure black love for the win, right? Just being able to see a historical example of a union that came together, right? Uh, of a of beautiful, lovely couple that came together and were able to create businesses, right? Not just one business, but businesses together and separately, right? I love that John had his own kind of niche, had his own market. Laula had her own niche, her own market, her own passion, and they each built those up independently from each other, but then also came together when it came to certain businesses. And I love that. So I love being able to see black love secure the back. All right, so we've been talking a lot about, you know, individuals and, and couples who've been able to build wealth and really build huge legacies and empires for themselves. But we're, we're gonna take a slight pivot, a slight shift and talk about someone who's really known for their community and individual service, All right? So we're gonna talk about Buck Colbert or B.C. Franklin. Born May 6, 1879 near Homer, Chickasaw Nation, Indian Territory, which you know currently is known as, as Oklahoma. B.C. Franklin is best known for being a warrior lawyer. He attended Dawes Academy in Berwyn and then later on Roger Williams University in Nashville, Tennessee. He followed his mentor, right? And I love that in his story you're able to really see that he has a, a mentor by the name of John Hope that he's able to really, you know, get that development from and really get that mentorship from. But he followed John Hope to Atlanta Baptist College, which is now known as Morehouse college where he graduated in 1903. Franklin and his beautiful queen Molly would get married in 1903 and would later have four beautiful children. 
Between 1904 and 1907, B.C. was an apprentice through black lawyers and he studied law by correspondence with the Sprague School of Law in Detroit. After scoring second highest, right, number two, right, right up there, he was admitted to the Oklahoma Bar in December 1907. Now, B.C. Franklin was a, a little late to the scene in, in Greenwood, Tulsa, when it comes to building and the foundation of it, right? So B.C. Franklin, he moved to Tulsa just a few months before the 1921 massacre. But nonetheless, his home and his law office was destroyed in the days following the massacre. But he did not let that stop him from being of service. He did not let that stop him from still being a pivotal part in the community and in individuals' lives. So with, with no house, with no formal law office, he set up a temporary law practice in a tent, right? He, just the determination, right? The resilience that you see in, in Black Tolsons and Greenwood natives and even to, to people like BC who came to Greenwood to, to find wealth didn't didn't necessarily find that the wealth they were looking for but still were able to serve the community so he set up a temporary law office or a law practice in a tent alongside his fellow attorney as isaiah h spears and the secretary effie thompson to provide legal protection to the vulnerable survivors of the 1921 massacre now something that i get right very clearly from B.C. Franklin's journey and his kind of legacy, right? Again, it's not necessarily the, the wealth, it's not the 54-door hotel that we see from, from J.B. Stratford, but what I do see unflinching, right, without a doubt, is the willingness and the ability to serve, right? And I think sometimes within you know the the history that we're living in or the context that we're living in today we think success means the fancy car right we think success means being the the best at something we think success means having a hundred thousand followers or having a million subscribers on youtube but you know bc franklin is known again a hundred years later for the service that he gave to these vulnerable people who just lost their home all right, these vulnerable families that just lost their business. He was able to, to serve them. And while he didn't win all the cases, he was able to, to help those that he was able to help. All right. So for, for you, as you're thinking about, you know, not only your big fancy dream, right, which you you deserve and you're 100 percent entitled to not not going to take away you securing the bag. But as you secure the bag, who can you also help serve? Right. Who can you help educate? Who can you help? protect who can you help empower who can you help enlighten while you are on your beautiful amazing journey to secure your dream so there you go scholars those are the nine amazing entrepreneurs servants leaders and warriors who are part of really building the foundation to to tulsa black wall street or to the legacy of greenwood period we have ow Gurley, we have jb stratford we have aj smitherman we have ellis walker woods we have simon berry we have john and laula williams we have bc franklin and for number nine, who do we have, right? I know you might be thinking like, oh, Devon, we're counting. That's only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight entrepreneurs. Who is number nine, Devon? Number nine, I'm gonna leave to you, okay? I want you to do a little bit of research. I want you to find one other entrepreneur that we did not highlight in this video that we did not highlight inside of this course i want you to do a little bit of research and drop their information within the comments or within the discussion okay nothing major right let me let me get their name when they were born and what they were known for right three things their name 
when they were born, and what they were known for. Go ahead and put that inside the comments. I wanna see how many different stories we can get, how many different entrepreneurs can we highlight within the comments and within the discussion. Now, of course, we, we greatly appreciate y'all for tuning in. If you are watching on YouTube, definitely make sure you give us a like, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and tell a friend about Play Black Wall Street. If you are enrolled in the course, you know we appreciate you becoming a member and for joining. Make sure you review the study guide, review those key terms that are there, and keep on coming back. Play Black Wall Street Academy is available for you to enroll today for just $1. Click the link in the description and become a member of Play Black Wall Street Academy so you can be on the other side and you can be over here with these lovely, amazing scholars. We appreciate y'all and of course, make sure y'all keep on snacking. Peace. None of that was recorded. Oh, that hurts so much.